The bedrooms of teenage boys are the sites of mass murder. Within the egg was a tiny preformed human, and within that, another, and within that, another. The excesses which nature provided me in my conjugal relations. Man is more perfect than woman because the male has more innate heat. The spermists versus the ovists. A great debate runs through the study of natural science and was initiated by Aristotle, who analyzed the alternative methods of development known as preformation and epigenesis. Preformationist theories assume that a miniature individual exists either in the egg or sperm and begins to grow into its adult form as the result of some sort of proper stimulus. Epigenesis, which Aristotle favored, is based on the belief that each embryo or organism is gradually produced from an undifferentiated mass by a series of steps through which new parts are added. Galen, the prolific Greek surgeon, was one of the few who disagreed with Aristotle's epigenetic theory. In On the Semen, Galen disputed Aristotle's idea that the female does not form any counterpart to the male semen. The female testes, uh, we, we would call them ovaries, the female testes, Galen argued, secrete semen into the horns of the uterus where male and female sexual products mix with blood furnished by the mother to form the fetus. As the fetus developed, the liver, heart, and brain appeared after the formation of the liver, fetal life was rather like the life of a plant because it was nourished under the influence of the vegetative soul. With the formation of the heart, fetal life was more like that of an animal because the heart served as the source of heat. Galen argued that human beings are the most perfect of all the animals, but man is more perfect than woman because the male has more innate heat. Perhaps Mrs. Galen also liked to use him uh, as a hot water bottle in the middle of the night. Furthermore, it was a deficiency of innate heat that caused a fetus to become a female. As proof of his theory, Galen cited the effects of castration. By removing the source of heat, castration caused the body of a eunuch to become more like a woman. Galen's influence on early medicine was profound and his legacy lasted far longer than it probably should have. Spurred partly by the invention of the microscope and the window it provided into the world of the microscopic, the 17th century saw an eruption of interest in the theory of preformationism. Two camps of preformationists arose, the ovists and the spermists. The ovists believed that within the egg was a tiny preformed human and within that another, and within that another, like a series of nesting dolls. If this ovum or seed found fertile ground, aka a uterus, in the presence of fertilizer, that would be the semen, it would start to grow larger and larger. Conveniently, all of this allowed for all of humanity to have been created by God in one fell swoop at the moment of creation which tied up some loose ends about where do all these people keep coming from anyways. The fact that this meant within each woman was a series of people becoming smaller and smaller to infinity, perhaps, was eagerly lapped up by scientists clutching their copies of Principia Mathematica. Infinitesimally small people were a nice connection to this new field of calculus. At the vanguard of preformationists was this famous microscopist, Antonio van Leeuwenhoek. His microscope had opened up the squiggling world of the microscopic, and he was eager to find samples to examine. He realized that he needn't look further than the excesses of his conjugal relations. Imagine his surprise after a bottle of Merlot and an evening of Vivaldi to examine his own semen and re realize the cacophony of wriggling action therein. Squinting closer, 
at his homemade single-lensed microscope, Van Leeuwenhoek gasped in amazement. Surely, this little wriggling creatures that he sees, they must be tiny people. It was not a set of nesting female dolls, but of male dolls. And then inside Adam's testicles, at the moment of creation, was the whole human race. He hastily penned letters to colleagues and the Royal Society, including a number of figures of these sperm, these animalcules that he saw. Worried that his studies would bring uh, his piousness into question, he wrote that the samples were not obtained by any sinful contrivance, but were made with the excesses which nature provided me in my conjugal relations. But then worried that the validity of his techniques would be called into question, you know, is this an old sample? He added that the sample was examined before six beats of the pulse had intervened between ejaculation and microscopic analysis. One steamboat, two steamboat, three steamboat. Uh, Mrs. Van Leeuwenhoek must have been long-suffering, indeed, or short-suffering, perhaps. Ultimately, though, one of the nails in the spermist preformationist coffin was not a scientific one, but a theological one. Van Leeuwenhoek did a back-of-the-envelope calculation and realized that since sperm were so small that a million would not fit in one grain of sand, there must be an enormous quantity in each sample of ejaculate. If one of these sperm then contained within it an infinite series of tiny preformed humans, the bedrooms of teenage boys are the sites of mass murder. Even the excesses with which nature provides during conjugal relations are a horrible waste. How could God be so callous and wasteful with his creation? Partly as a result of this tricky observation, Ovist preformationism would be largely favored until more than 150 years later, uh, when cell theory would finally put the debate to rest and help to reveal epigenesis with the union of egg and sperm forming an undifferentiated embryo as the mechanism of reproduction.